Iron Harvest. By God, Allah, and all the other deities up above, I want to love this game. Yet it makes it very, very difficult at times. On the one hand, the latest DLC, though, frankly, rather than DLC, I really do believe that Operation Eagle deserves a far more ancient and venerable term. Namely, Expansion Pack, rather than DLC. It comes with a full new faction, with its own units, its own voice acting, and its own fully animated and voice acted campaign at the price of $20. Plus, of course, the fact that it is a standalone expansion, meaning that you can play multiplayer just fine without buying the main game, but you will of course be limited to playing US Sonia, the new faction. In this day and age, that is excellent value for money, but it retreads a lot of the same erroneous ground of the original, particularly when it comes to the campaign, which I find to be slow and exceptionally plodding. The story itself is an improvement upon the base game, quite considerably so as well, though it is in large parts just Lawrence of Arabia with the occasional mech here and there, though the addition of battle camels is certainly a nice one. It is criminal, however, that they are not available in multiplayer, because surely battle camels would be an excellent unit for the battlefields of Europe. But my main issue remains the relatively slow and plodding nature of the campaign. This was firmly evident in the first mission of the Polania campaign, where you engage in essentially the precise same firefight, something along the lines of seven times before you finish the mission. The USONIA campaign has this yet again in spades, including arbitrary stealth missions in a game, of course, not designed to have stealth missions in the slightest. And one of the most egregious sins in strategy video gaming's the random overwhelming survive this bullshit counterattack scenario is played out not once, not twice, but three times in the first three missions in a row. And since you have no hope in ever living hell of surviving these counterattacks, unless you have prepared for them, they swiftly turn a 30 minute mission into an hour long mission, as you've got to repeat the damnable things to be prepared for the counterattack. Many of these sins are also made even worse by the main character, William Mason whom is at once your most powerful unit in most missions, as he, carrying around a gigantic autocannon, is able to mulch infantry and mix alike with brutal ease, is also a point of constant frustration, as he is also your slowest unit, always lagging behind everyone else, and in missions where you have multiple units moving at multiple different speeds, you will always have to simply just stop and wait for Mason to catch up to you so that he can kill all of the enemies. This leisurely pace makes missions that are already too long in comparison to the amount of actual action and fighting that are in them excruciatingly slow. And this really is a shame because the story overall is pretty darn good, albeit somewhat lacking in originality. The cutscenes are lovingly animated, the voice acting is good if not brilliant, and the general gist of it too, very, very solid. And let's be honest, how many people in this day and age even know of Lawrence of Arabia? And hey, if you don't, then it's a pretty good story. And there are worse ways to enjoy it than in video game format, even if the pacing leaves something to be desired. As for the US Sonia faction itself, it is a little, again, I think sadly lacking in originality. 
One of the greatest strengths of the base game is the fact that all three of the factions are quite different. Best illustrated in their infantry. The Saxonians have medium range SMGs, the Polanians have long range rifles, and the Rusviets have short range shotguns, whereas the Usonians have semi automatic rifles reminiscent of the M1 Carand, which feels like they do almost as well at any range. They don't seem particularly weak up close, they don't seem particularly bad at mid-range, and they don't seem all that terrible at long range either. Though I have noticed if they're engaging anything in cover, they feel worse than useless. Perhaps even more so than the other weapons. So you could argue it's a little bit of a middle of the road thing, but seeing as cover is already a prerequisite for any infantry engagement in game, if that is the intent, it doesn't really come across. For the rest of them, they've got the basic classes. They have a flamethrower, an anti-tank gunner, a machine gunner, and a medic. They don't, however, come with the grenadiers. Which is an interesting little aside, but I feel like a little bit more in the way of unique infantry or more effect on their weaponry would be better than simply taking away one of their abilities to throw grenades. They also have a pair of unique infantry units, one of which is considerably more unique than the other. That is the Armoured Engineers in Exoskeletons. They are not the greatest fighters and will probably get their ass kicked by any other dedicated exoskeleton, but they'll happily tear through unarmoured infantry, and they can even be a fair bit of a danger to lone walkers as well. But the biggest point is of course their ability to repair very, very quickly. And they also have a veterancy ability that lets you put down a building that lets you heal and reinforce infantry squads on the field. That is a very big deal, and I'm very glad it's a veterancy one, otherwise it would have been blindingly overpowered. Considering how long it takes to retreat all the way back to base in Iron Harvest, the ability to replenish on the field is enormously powerful. On that note as well, their second infantry unit, the paratrooper, is another one. It is essentially just the basic rifleman troop, but they cost about twice as much in metal, and they also cost oil. This is uh, a, a lot of resources to put into a basic rifleman squad, as they don't have any upgrades either. They can't be given, you know, LMGs or SMGs or anything like that in the Company of Heroes style. What they can do, though, is be, as the name suggests, paradropped anywhere on the map. Now that too can be a very, very, very big deal in Iron Harvest, due to the time it takes to traverse the map, and some maps being really kinda huge as well, the ability to dump down an infantry squad anywhere at any time, even straight on top of enemy heavy machine guns or behind their bunkers, that is a big deal, and a good one too, because I do think the cost is enough to offset the advantage. Yes, it gives you a significant momentary advantage, but you are spending twice the resources and some oil for that advantage, which I think is fair. I would also like to have seen more USonia focus on this aspect, because of course they also introduce the air units. Now, this is where a little bit of confusion comes into the picture, because it was mentioned that there would be air units and anti-air buildings, anti-air defenses, alright? Well, the air units certainly are in the game, and there are air units for the other factions too, but they are all generic air units. There is the air bike, which is kind of like a fighter style unit, though it is also surprisingly amazing at ground attack. In fact, the current multiplayer meta, it feels like, is just having a lot of those bikes. Because they will absolutely, once you get two or maybe three of them, which you can even get via the early reinforcement system, they will shred light mechs quite handily. And oh boy, they will butcher infantry. And they're fast, which again, in a game as relatively slow as Iron Harvest, having a unit that is both fast and ignores terrain, 
big deal. The second genetic flying unit is a balloon with a huge ass cannon strapped underneath it, which serves as a sort of flying anti-tank vehicle. This one is quite expensive, quite slow, and exceptionally vulnerable to the flying air bikes. But oh boy does it pack one hell of a punch. Now this would normally I think have been a fairly decent idea if it weren't for one particular problem. Namely that a lot of the mechs that it can kill very quickly could usually deal with it too by firing back except because it's a flyer it has a nasty habit of being able to park itself on top of terrain, on top of a hill or some sort of building that will actually block the land-based mech's shots, making it essentially invulnerable. I've had a couple occasions where I've had anti-armor infantry units, usually quite capable of mulching flyers, be unable to actually shoot at the target because it was sitting on top of a little hill. And so my dudes would walk up to the base of it and then just start milling around in circles because they couldn't actually aim up enough to shoot. That is a big old issue because it has kind of removed one of the counters. USonia also has their own flying unit, which is a little bit of a um, bulky flying tank thing that fires a spread of unguided rockets. Very good against clumps of infantry and a pretty hard counter, in fact, to infantry clumps. Can also deal with armor and it'll fight one-on-one -on -one reasonably well with most early tier mechs, but that's certainly not its role. Now, the idea of air units as a whole. Let's talk about this a little bit here because it is one of the main selling points of the expansion pack. And I'm going to call it that because I do feel it deserves the honorary title of expansion pack. The air units are quite powerful. The US Odia unique one is devastating to infantry, but not overpowered because it can be dealt with by mechs fairly easily, and it's surprisingly slow and cumbersome if you, you know, don't take into consideration that it can cross mountains, which is a big old advantage. The air bikes feel too good for what they are. They deal so much damage and they're so hard to kill because of their speed and ability to ignore terrain that they've become probably one of my, well, best early game mechs because they can counter the enemy's flyers, have being able to ignore the whole hill problem, and also do a buttload of damage to ground targets. The anti-tank gun too can be situationally wonderful, but the big issue here is that the flying units feel too powerful, not because they really necessarily are, but because there's no good counterplay to them. The American super duper mega flying fortress of bullshit is the excellent example of this. Now the uh, US Onians have three heroes, one is an Iradian lady with a musket, which deals relatively well with infantry, but she's kind of underwhelming. Next up is Mason the Younger in his power armored suit. He's really good. He can deal with both infantry and armor, and can also deploy his suit of power armor as a turret. He feels like a really solid and fairly well-balanced hero, as he's certainly not unkillable, but he dishes out one hell of an amount of damage with relatively decent durability as well at okay ranges. He feels really good. And then there's his daddy, the commander of the Orbital Space Fortress. This thing is a problem. It outranges virtually everything that is intended to counter it, and with its ability to just park itself on top of a hill, it becomes a monster of absolute murder-death-kill, capable of killing mechs, tons of them, and you'd think that the little air bikes being anti-air and kind of fighter-style things would be good against it. Oh no, it can kill two of them before they're even in range. It mulches mechs, it kills infantry, and it has anti-air. You might think that, okay, and in fact this was one of my ways as well, a large number of anti-tank infantry, the gunners, would be the best answer. And in a way they are because they can pile on the damage surprisingly quickly, but the super orbital battle barge also has 
A flamethrower that can cover the entire front of the vehicle in a huge arc with instant splatter death kill murder fire beams. So yeah, infantry really isn't an option either and again that's only when you can actually shoot the bloody thing or when it's chilling on top of a mountain. Now it is very very slow and it's easy to run circles around it but I've literally been able to just fly it into the enemy's base, activate the flamethrower, kill his whole base in one duration of the flamethrower ability and then just sail on out again nonchalantly. That, too, is a bit of a big problem. And to return to kind of the point as well, they need a counter because the current in-game mechs, whilst they are able to shoot at the flying units, they can't do so well. And the melee mechs, of course, are now, well, kind of obsolete all of a sudden, since a hovering anti-tank gun will hard counter your melee mechs, which were already quite vulnerable due to the need to get into close quarters combat. That's not a good idea. You've invalidated a considerable portion of your own cool ass mechs by doing this, and they haven't added in any dedicated anti-air units. Now supposedly some maps have capturable anti-air structures, which are very dangerous and will rip air units out of the sky in seconds, but there are no anti-air infantry, no anti-air mechs, and the only anti-air unit is indeed the bikes, which are themselves too good because they can kill air and ground just as well. That is a big balance problem, and it also takes a lot of the attention away from the coolest part of the game, the mechs, as the flyers do not have anywhere near the amount of charm that the mechs do, which all wobble, vibrate, and shake, and spew engine noise and fire all over the place in a truly endearing fashion. Whilst the flyers are just kind of uninspired flying things, it's just a balloon with things attached to it half the time. Not all that interesting, and yet now they're outperforming the interesting part of the game. And here's the thing as well, in, say, Company of Heroes, it has had, oh god, so many balance issues, I could probably talk about that all day. Like, the Fallschirmjäger, when they were first around, they could just simply pop out of stealth and wipe out your entire infantry blob before you could even bat a goddamn eyelash. Not to mention the British Kangaroo, a vehicle that wasn't fixed until Company of Heroes 2 was on the way out. And the reason why that was so absurd was because it was a heavily armoured, super fast armoured personnel carrier that cost next to nothing, which you could fill with infantry squads armed with Peats, the Peat, the, the incredibly ass backwards anti-tank launcher, google it if you don't want to know what it is, which could be fired with pinpoint precision whilst moving across rough terrain at max speed in this armoured carrier. It was to the point that it could, it, it was undefeatable economically. It traded incredibly well against anti-tank guns, against infantry, against panthers, against tigers, against everything. Or oh, you'd kill them all right, but the British player would invest 60 fuel to kill 120 fuel. And eventually, you'd just lose because of it. The point I'm trying ever so laboriously to make my way towards here is that in a really great game, Balance issues can be incredibly frustrating, but they are not in and of themselves enough to really turn you off. In a game like Iron Harvest that is so close to greatness yet just can't quite get that final meter over the finishing line, a balance issue then, just as you're teetering kind of the edge, but a balance issue then, just as you're kind of teaching on the edge whether to love or hate the game, that can be devastating. So let me come to some conclusions here, shall we? If you've already bought, played Iron Harvest and enjoyed that campaign, then you will have no problems with this. In fact, you will find a better product with the USONIA campaign and you will undoubtedly enjoy it.
if you're currently playing and enjoying the multiplayer, some of the initial balance issues are probably going to uh, twist your nipples, at least at first, but hopefully balance fixes will be incoming. Again, a balance problem is... On the one hand, it's something clearly worthy of critique, because I do believe that one of the issues with Iron Harvest is that they're often putting a little bit too much of their resources in two different directions, trying to make both a single player and a multiplayer game at the same time, which end up in either one or both suffering. In this case, the multiplayer may have taken the biggest hit, as the introduction of air units, while sounding cool, runs into a whole hell of a lot of issues, particularly when, for some baffling reason, you've chosen to not actually add in any dedicated anti-air units, which seems like a very odd oversight. If, however, you're wondering whether or not this is a interesting entry point into Iron Harvest, whether you should pick it up now. Well, you gotta ask yourself, how do you like your RTS campaigns? Because this one is quite slow, and the pacing is, in my opinion, not very well done. If you're more of a fan of the old Company of Heroes or Red Alert style games, this is probably gonna be too slow and too plodding for you. If you don't mind that, however, again, the story is quite good. It is well delivered in a well animated and voice acted fashion. As for the multiplayer, U.S. Sonya is certainly the better entry point, because for 20 bucks, which again, for the amount of content, is not at all a bad asking price, you can access to the multiplayer. And you can then ask yourself whether or not you'd want to try and have a look at the other factions as well. Maybe even open them up for individual purchase further down the line. I really do struggle with giving it a full recommendation, though, because... The multiplayer scene, whilst certainly not dead, is a little bit on the struggling side. The free weekend absolutely helped quite a lot, and you've got about a wait of between three to five odd minutes for a match, which isn't horrible by any extent of the imagination, but not fantastic either. And the balance issues... Well, they can get quite annoying at times, particularly as some of them are by design, not being able to shoot an airship on top of a cliff. And there's also the unavoidable problem whenever you're trying to enter into an RTS as a first-time player. A lot of really sweaty tryhards who view your new bass as a fresh and rare delicacy to be plucked in a most violent and intrusive fashion. The best I can really do is to say, if you do enjoy Iron Harvest, if you are currently playing it, then this will only add more to your enjoyment. But if you already haven't been able to get into Iron Harvest, either the single player campaign or the multiplayer, this, sadly, will not do anything to convince you. Though, again, mm, the, the greatness is genuinely so, so very, very close, and it is so frustrating to see what should, by all accounts, be a genuinely amazing experience be hampered by all of these tiny niggling problems. <sighs> Anywho, until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.